Hello. Hello. What's up? What, okay, what are you doing right now? What are you doing right now? A puzzle? What are you yeah. doing? Okay, well, it's, pieces. it's it's not puzzle time. It's podcast. Time. Oh, is that right now? Okay, That's I'll get on right now. Bye. Okay, all right. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Good. Oh, yeah. What's going on? I'm ready. Oh, my God. I don't know whether I should show Oscar my, you know, when he didn't cast me in those plays in San Francisco when I was a young actress. It'd be good for him to see my background. Ready for a close-up for a podcast. I mean, who gets ready for a close-up on a podcast? I like that light. I think that light is good. I'll tell you something. I'll tell you a story. I wrote a play in San Francisco with a playwright, a very well-known playwright. We wrote it for ourselves. I was the actress, he was the playwright, but I ended up writing with him. And the night of opening night, um, the lights go down and he looks at me and he said, I don't know my lines. And I was like, I was, I'm gonna have to do the whole play, both parts, my part and his part. And you know what happened? He was fantastic. And I was, oh, there you are. I was just preparing. Can you hear, it, hear me? It reminds me of, of Jesse because he always gets really nervous. And then- When do I get really nervous? You get really nervous, but then agent, it's like you take over. So I was just, I was just telling the team a little bit about, there we go. Well, first of all, just so you know, I won't be talking about my theatrical background. Thank awesome. God, thank God. Well, you know, what do you mean, Jesus? I mean, you, we've been depending on my theatrical background for the last 20 years to keep this thing going, but I'm just wanna, you know, say. Anyway, the last time we saw Oscar, it was, remember what it was, it was people were shutting down. Weren't they shutting down? It was Richard III, what was it? The other one, the Great Prince. Well, it, we should know our Shakespeare, since you're such a scholar. Hello, there's Oscar. Hey, Oscar, how are you? Oh, it is good to see you, comrade. You too. How are you feeling? They promised me I'd get to see you, so they seduced me. <laughs> well, well, I can't take you to dinner now because I, I can't come to New York. But that sucks. But, uh, but yeah. that'll change. That'll change. Yeah, I'm hoping. How how is? Do you know Priscilla? You remember Priscilla, right? Hey, Priscilla, Hi. good to see. You, of course. Good to see you. How are you? I'm I'm okay. You know, it's. Uh, on the one hand, I'm in the same boat as everybody else. And on the other hand, you know, I'm trying to keep a nonprofit institution afloat, which is um, really scary. <laughs> it's, you know, I think we're going to do it, but boy, oh boy. You know, um, you were counting on you to do that. Well, I think we will. But, you know, it, it, there's, there's both the fact that we're all going a little insane now at the six month mark. Yeah. It's just, it's starting to you know, get disorienting about what is real and what is normal yeah. and what's not. It's, uh, yeah, it's beyond Groundhog's Day, isn't it? It's just like that's a, right. You know, before this, you were you were just dealing with Julius Caesar, and the, <laughs> the troubles of Julius Caesar. How would Joseph Papp deal with COVID nineteen? Oh my God, I don't know. But you know, what's also I'm sure you guys are experiencing some of this too. As as we hit September, every parent on our staff is suddenly crazy. They're suddenly completely right. messed up with the kids in school situation. And, you know, the loss of the unemployment thing is causing strains. Yeah, you know, it's just, I think this is going to be a tough fall. Honestly, you know, what, what is, um, uh, what does Shakespeare mean in the time of social distancing? Well, we did a serialized version of Richard II with WNYC this summer which was a mostly black production that was dedicated to Black Lives Matter. And we wove a lot of discussion of that around the production. And we thought that was pretty great. And it was, I listened to it, by the way. And then they did a whole podcast about it after right, that. Right. Been, yeah. Oh, thanks. And, you know, honestly, part of what um, has gotten me is that both that and some of the Zoom plays we've done have immediately reached viewers all over the country and in certain cases all over the world. And you know more about this, Jess, but for me, it's just like, I don't want to give that audience up. So right. when, when we come back, I'm going to be trying to figure out how we can keep reaching those people because the, the it's very distressing not to be in person and you lose a lot from not in person. 
but boy, is it great to have people in Kazakhstan write you and tell you that they were moved by what you did. You know, it's really. Can I ask you a question? Exciting. Is it is it still theater? Like you know, this is captured content. So you did the radio, you know, on Zoom a play. But is is that theater now? Do we have to change the definition of what theater is? Well, you know, as usual, when we're trying to cope with emergency, we try to not worry about the label too much and just what we do. You know, what I will say is that we have tried very hard on the Zoom plays, for example, both of them, their first performances were live um, and keeping the live performance of it, which is then taped and reproduced, felt really important to us. It felt like, oh, that's why it's not a movie or, or a television show. That's why it's theater, because it's it's happening right in front of you, even if it's not geographically in front of you, it's in time right in front of you. But some of these other things, we're, we're gonna release a 20 minute experimental musical video that I don't know, I, I don't see how you could really call it theater, but we're, we made it and we're releasing it, so. You know, but you're, you're used to going to theater almost every night, you know, around the, the country. Has this impacted the way that you find young talent how you you talk to you know other other you know directors and actors and just the whole thing has it changed the vibe of what you do utterly utterly don't meet young talent uh conversations with artistic directors are overwhelmingly commiseration <laughs> just, right. you know and we i actually talk more to other artistic directors than they usually do because we're just so desperate to share our problems with each other but it's, you know, I, the, probably the biggest practical thing is I cook dinner every night. Um, yeah. I haven't cooked dinner every night at any point in my life because I've been in the theater four to six nights a week. Yeah. Yeah. So. But what about, you know, you also have such incredible relationships with the playwrights. So, but they must be dreaming and, you know, a lot of surrealism. I mean, what, where are we going? Are we going into fantasy? What are people thinking about? What do people want to write about now? It's really interesting because the playwrights, of course, are on one level the least directly affected by this. They can do their work in almost the same way that they were doing their work before. But their responses have been wildly different. Some of them have become crazy prolific. Um, you know, my friend Mr. Kushner is probably writing more steadily than I've ever known him to do. It's not necessarily, you know, at lightning speed because it's Tony. But he's writing every day in a way that it was always a struggle for um, Between us, this isn't for announcement yet, but Susan Lloyd Parks has gone back to writing a play every day. And she's keeping what she calls the Journal of the Plague Year. And it's every day a play. And we expect that she will keep going until the plague is lifted. And then we'll figure out how to produce all of them. <laughs> you know? yeah. At that point, hundreds of plays. I mean, they're short plays, but so every writer is different and how they're. You know, um, AIDS, AIDS so, you know, disproportionately affected the theater at the time that, that a lot of people who were great playwrights were around, you know, passed away from the, from that plague. And, you know, it influenced that art for a long time. A lot of, a lot of art that wasn't made because people fell on the road there, you know, like, how do you see this, how do you see COVID affecting, you know, the art that's coming up and, and have we lost people? Like, how do you, how do you see this time? Yeah, no, of course we've lost people. Um, you know, it's not, we haven't yet had the kind of seismic shock that we had when Michael Bennett died or when um, Charlie Ludlam died. And, you know, when I think of the, the hole that was rent in the American theater by Charlie Ludlam dying, it's just crazy. I mean, just that, that body of work just vanished. Horrible. We haven't had anything like that yet. But the thing that's, a, I think, a great comparison with the AIDS crisis is actually the combination of the um, uh, COVID crisis and Black Lives Matter. Because what the AIDS crisis, of course, it funded the big picture uh, uh, afterlife of the AIDS crisis was a level of empowerment and fierceness and um, ultimately normalization of the gay community in America that was unimaginable for him. And, and that crisis forced that community to become militant, forced that community, 
the community become unified and ultimately take their story out in a way that it changed what it means to be gay in America. And I think it is possible that something similar is happening with the Black Lives Matter movement. It is possible that, you know, the COVID in a way is separable, but given its disproportionate impact on black and brown populations, it's not really separable. And this uprising happened, and I tell you, I think it's gonna change the theater. I know that, I think the theater is gonna be different and is going to be a much more anti-racist and egalitarian place when we come out of this, if it's gonna to deserve to survive. You know, um, young people in the, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, it's much harder for them to get that, for that voice to find its way to you, to, to develop, you know, you've developed so many young artists over the years. It's like how, you know, in the time where we physically can't meet, how do you recognize that talent? And, and how do you, how do you find it, rise it up and, and support it? You know, how do we, you know, when we came out of AIDS, we had a, mechanisms you still had the theater you still had an audience where you could go you know workshop a play and 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 figure it out you know how, how do you see that happening with this well i i can tell you what we're doing um without making claims that it's comprehensive um we've done a pretty radical um redistribution of power and authority within the organization part of that is i've added two associate artistic directors of color um, Sahima Lee and Shanta Thake, uh, one African, one um, South Asian. And uh, those people are now operating the highest levels of the organization artistically and have uh, concomitant authority. And there are other um, uh, artistic staff members of color, other program heads of color uh, and black program heads who um, essentially I've delegated more authority to. And those people are bringing me people that I have never heard of or worked with before. And they're telling me to pay attention. And so I'm doing what they say. And that decentralization of power, I think is gonna have a lasting impact on the public. It's gonna be post COVID because it actually feels like a better way to run the theater where I'm actually, you know, it's, I, I think honestly, my practice had gotten a little too privatized in the last few years. I'd fallen victim to old white cisgender male disease and because I was older than anybody, I've been around so much, and don't you know, I, you know, just I start closing in my decision-making process. It starts to be, no, we're going to do this. We're going to, you know, private. And this is sort of forced that open again in what I think is a really beautiful way. Um, and, I, and I hope that, like reaching an international audience, that will continue and blossom after this crisis is over. Can you have to you, Oscar? We realized we didn't, we're in the middle of our story, but... Um, Everybody who's listening or watching, this is Oscar Eustis, the director of uh, the incredible public theater and many other things that he's done in his life. But anything else you want to say about yourself? Uh, that, that's, <laughs> that's the most important thing. Other than that, I'm married to the greatest woman in the world and my daughter hung the moon. But okay. other than that. Those are good. Um, so you Oscar, know, you know, or do you have a question for Sid? No, no, go. You know, the theater always leads the way. You know, we started by talking about Julius Caesar, the controversy around Julius Caesar. Um, and I guess that we've for a long time had a way, you know, we, we've all, at least in my lifetime, counted on the theater, uh, you know, songs, theater, you know, uh, uh, to, to lead the way. Um, is it harder to figure out how to do that during this time where now we've had, because I, you know, We've seen plays done every which way you could do them, but now we've taken away the audience. You know, is that, is this a new uh, complication to, to the way art is going to lead us forward? God, yes. yes. Uh, it's incredibly difficult for us to figure out how to deal with it. Um, but it's our job to deal with it, right? It's, I, I spent about three to four weeks, I, I had COVID right at the, and was hospitalized right at the start of that I was actually in the hospital when we shut my theater down. On, I went in on the 10th of March. We shut the theater down on the 12th. And when I came out on the 15th, it was a new world. And I spent about two weeks, which I like to think was partly because I was still recovering, feeling sorry for myself and um, declaring to everybody who would listen that we weren't going to become a film studio and we don't make television, we make theater. So we're just not doing anything until we come back. And after about two weeks, I realized I was being an absolute asshole and a coward 
because just because times are really rough does not relieve us of the responsibility to propel our mission forward. And we have an obligation to the artists who make up our community. We have an obligation to the staff who work here. And we have a real obligation to, the, to our public, to our audience. And it's not like they don't need what we're doing anymore. We can, we can now measure it by eyeballs and views. And we've got hundreds of thousands of people who want what we're producing. Um, so we know there's a need for it. We know there's an appetite. We just have to figure out how to do it. Because as Mark said, um, forgive the gender, men make history, but they do not make it in conditions of their own choosing. <laughs> and this is very much where we are right now. We are not, we didn't choose these, but we have to work within them. I'll ask you a question that when you think about going back to some of the more some of the theater, you know, you were working on 70s, 80s, San Francisco, when you think about Marie Irene and Fornes or some of the other, the, you know, early, you know, playwrights that were also in the real world, right? So the real world is still a possibility if you're social distance. Can you be at Washington Square Park, for example? Can you bring people to the park and, and, and still do some magnificent things? I mean, we're going to get into winter now, but just the idea of, you know, not being in that enclosed space, but like using more of the city in a, in a way of those things that you're working on or been doing or thinking about. You bet. And in New York, we have pretty tight legal restrictions on what we're allowed to even attempt to do. Because of course, the for absolutely righteous reasons, the government is interested in us not bringing together a large group of people in a dangerous way. So, and we, unlike motorcycle riders and Sturgis, we completely respect that and believe in that. So part of what we're exploring is how can we get people to gather but stay safe? Um, and over the course of the fall and winter, there's a number of projects that we've designed that are different experiments in that, both in terms of things that we do outdoors in a pop-up manner, things that we do outdoors in a ticketed and you know sort of carefully constrained environment but also over the course of the winter we're going to be um, uh, putting up at least four experimental shows that work for one or two people at a time that work for tiny audiences um, and again as always in this case you're trying to figure out how can that limitation become a um, victory and you know, one, there's a couple of the projects that are pretty far along now in, in terms of the miniature audiences that I think we're gonna make some intimate experiences happen that people are, I think are just gonna be incredibly hungry for. Um, one of them is specifically about finding ways to become deep with an absolute stranger. And it connects up two people at a time in a completely safe way with a series of prompts that you know, it's really it's really interesting, right? So it's it's not going to generate the ticket revenue that Hamilton generated in the past, and it's not, you know, it's but it's still it's worth doing. It's worth but it's doing. also those kinds of experiences. Um, you know, what was it? Was it Maria Abramovich? I think somebody she did it in the she did that thing in the in the museum. I don't yeah. know. Whitney, uh, right? Abramovich, yeah, Abramovich. Yeah. But but everybody was watching. But so that's an interesting thing because. What is theater? Okay, what is your definition? Is it just an experience in the real, well, now it's changing, but it is still the kind of ritual of gathering. So if, a, if you have two people or three people, that is a really incredible thing because it will change like theater every, every time you do it. Right. And that in itself could be a scalable thing that could go on for a really, really, really long time. Right. And then that story changes, That's right? right? depending on who the, the folks are. Is that like a curated thing that a playwright is designing or? And, uh, uh, the specific one, which I would say more about, although I can't announce it yet, <laughs> is the creation of a devised theater company that we're close to. And they it's two folks that have been working on it together. And you know, they're amazingly creative people. So I'm, uh, I've done beta testing of, uh, the early versions and it's very exciting. But I, you know, look, I'm not gonna be happy and I don't think anybody in New York is gonna be happy until the Delacour opens again with Free Shakespeare in the Park. I, you know, I'm, I, there's part of me that's kind of hoping we can't open up till the summer because the first thing I'd like to do is open up on that stage for free for 2000 people at a shot. And 
you know, if we actually go with someone without being able to do that, I'm going to be in a very bad place. You know, because, um, you know, Julius Caesar has been produced for the last, you know, it's longest continuously produced piece of material in the world. Usually you guys do it in when Obama was, you know, the guy It reflected Obama's policies when when Trump was the guy it reflected Trump's policy it became incredibly controversial. But if we did it today, if you did it right now, you were going to put it up. What would you? What constraints? What What would you do to the story now? I, you know, I don't know what I'd do to the story. Um, and I was so happy with what I did in 2017. Although so so many other people were so unhappy about it. Um, you know what happens? You get you get in the room, and literally what happened in that production in 2017, I kept saying, "I'm not going to want it to be this literal." No, I am not going to want Calpurnia to speak with a Slovakian accent. Oh, wait a minute. I actually really like it when she speaks with a Slovakian accent. I'm not going to want him to wear his tie two inches below his belt. Well, actually, that looks great. You know, so what I found for, and to my surprise, that the more literal the on the nose that production was, the happier I was with it. Um, and that's, you know, you never know what's going to happen when you get in a room. That's, that's, of course, part of the reason that authoritarian regimes never like artists, because nobody controls what happens, not even the artist, when they go into the room. You know, what? why do you think that Shakespeare, you know, still has that, that lock on all of us? You know, this is, the man has been gone a long time, 300 right? years, you know, maybe 400 years. You know, what, what is the thing that, that no matter what's happening, it's always good. It's always interesting. Like, what's the thing that you think it does? Well, look, Shakespeare was the most gifted writer who's ever worked in English language theater, you know, maybe in the English language. I mean, there's no question that he had natural gifts that weren't taught by anybody and were just a, a gift from our creator. But I think the thing that made him Shakespeare was his audience, because he was the first generation of uh, writers who had to write for a secular audience because literally religious subjects were outlawed because of the two to compromise that to avoid the Catholics and the Protestants fighting for the first time in Christian history, it was simply illegal to do Christian subject matter on stage. So suddenly you didn't have the church censoring you. And he also had the most diverse audience that any playwright had ever had from illiterate groundlings to Queen Elizabeth, from Oxford and Yale graduates to the guy who cleaned up after the horses. All of those people gathered in one space, in one time, demanding to be entertained together. And you know, the funny thing about an audience, and I know you've experienced this, is that an audience needs to become one audience for a play to be really successful. You know, that scholars, I remember reading when I was a kid, you know, scholars saying, well, Shakespeare put in the comic parts to please the common people, and then the poetry was to please the, and this is bullshit. This is not how the theater works. If you can't check out of the parts you don't like of a play and still enjoy the play, you have to keep everybody with you all the time. And that means in a way that Shakespeare's plays became a machine for unifying that audience, which meant unifying that country, making everybody recognize they had more in common than they were different from each other. When everybody laughs at the same thing, you are building waves of solidarity among an audience. When everybody cries or is holding their breath at the same thing, that audience is becoming one unified thing. And Shakespeare had to do that. If he didn't do that, he wasn't gonna be able to make a living and forced by the democratic expanse of his audience to write material that would include and reflect everybody, he became the greatest writer in the history of the language. And that, that has, is a gift that is with us 400 years later. His work still does that to us. Because, and, and look at, I'm sorry, you got me on a roll, Jess, but look at also the composition of his acting company. We know from those of us who the plays that you need about 18 actors um, uh, who can speak, uh, have speaking parts in order to do the play. And it's helpful if you have about 10 others to carry spears, be extras, speak in unison. You know, that's about the size of Shakespeare's company we can tell from producing the plays. And he had to, it was a company, he had to employ them all in every play. So there are no two person Shakespeare plays. And that means that there's no Shakespeare play where two people fall in love 
that doesn't include the effect of their falling in love on their families and the effect of their falling in love on the state and the effect of their fall. There's no such thing as a private relationship in Shakespeare. He's got this whole cast. He's got to use them. And his mind was that marriage isn't a private act. Love is not a private act. It has a private face, but it also has a very social and public face. So that's actually, I believe, a truer representation of reality than most of what passes for drama on television. Because you know we Americans are just experts at siloing things. We're experts at saying, it's just about you and the girl you love and what's going on between you and nothing else matters. And of course, that's bullshit. Your parents matter, your class matters, your finances matter. All of those things go into what actually make up our lives. And Shakespeare embraced that and understood that. And that's why for me, he's still the greatest role model for a playwright. When you first saw Hamilton, it, and I'm not saying that Shakespeare, but when you first saw it, do you recognize those same elements of talking to an entire community and the amount of people? And you know, what did you see there that you went, yeah, this is the thing, you know? Well, Jesse, you of course put your finger right on the issue. Um, I, I worked on Hamilton for three and a half years before we opened it. So I saw it in progress. And within weeks, I was using the Shakespeare comparison because on a certain level, you just look at Hamilton and you go, this is exactly what Shakespeare did. Take the history of his country, elevate the language by make, turning it into verse. Shakespeare turned it into iambic pentameter, then Manuel turns it into rap and hip hop, but it's verse drama. And by turning it into verse, you elevate both the story and the people telling the story to heroic stature. And what Lynn did, that's exactly what Lynn did with Hamilton, and it's exactly what Shakespeare did with Henry V. It's the same project. And they both took the language of the common people and elevated it. And, you know, understanding that in addition to any other way you look at it, Ham Hamilton is verse drama. That's what it is, is poetic drama. Um, it just it just suddenly you realize the comparisons with Shakespeare are not a field. They are actually, I think, pretty apt. Um, you know, you're dealing with the classics and then you're dealing with young artists who are finding their way. They don't necessarily know their way. How, what's that, you know, I don't know how you would describe that, but how would you, how do you, you know, young directors, young writers, even actors, you know, how do you, emerging how do you, voices, maybe emerging voices? I don't know. What, how do you think about that? This is a horrible time for people who are at their early phases of their careers and early phases of their life as artists. It is a much more damaging time for them than it is for, certainly for people like me. I mean, I've had much, much more lies behind me than lies in front of me for my career. I've, I've had my career and I've been incredibly lucky. But when I look at my daughter as a theater director, she's just one example of 20 somethings who are suddenly um, faced with not just a, a delay, but an utter suspension of their ability to work in their chosen field. And um, they also, for most of them, they also lose their side gigs at exactly the same moment because just when all the theaters shut down, all the restaurants shut down and all the bars shut down. So, you know, we know waiting tables and bartending is the, you know, the way that so many young art at theater arts support themselves. That's all gone. And um, I am worried sick about it. I'm worried sick about what that's going to do to the profession. And one of the things I'm positive of is that the institutions are going to have to really try and take care of people when we come back, really try and, and we, we've done some artist relief uh, payments. We've done, done, you know, for 363, actually not just artists, but freelancers, technicians, crew members, stage managers. We've done one round of relief payments and we're going to do another. And it's not enough to, you know, support people for any length of time. It's not a, um, doesn't replace an income, but it does give some help. And it also says to them, we see you. We're not, we're not ignoring the fact that every freelance theater artist in the country was instantly completely unemployed on March 12th and hasn't worked for six months. You know, when those, go ahead Priscilla. No, I, I was just going to ask what it's like if you're able to go out, you know, what it feels like to be in New York right now. What it, 
what does it feel like? What is what is going on? And what's the feeling? I mean, New York, the you know, the city. Uh, is that stamina, that resilience? Is that there? I mean, the, the, this city has been through probably more than any other place in America, anyway, in the United States. What's it like now? This 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 city is battered. There's no question, um, and bruised. But it's going to be resilient. Um, I think uh, there is a lot of anger here in the city um, because I think this city, you know, the bomb of the coronavirus went off here like nowhere else. We also had, therefore, an absolute hospital bed eyes view of the lack of leadership of the federal government. And although the state stepped in and Cuomo did an admirable job and is doing an admirable job in many ways, it can't replace the leadership of the country as a whole because there are things that simply require federal intervention. And we know we didn't get it. And we know it killed 25,000 of us. And we went through March and April and May when sirens were the background music for the city. And you know, it's been over the summer, it's been less oppressive because obviously the infection rate and the death rate has gone way down. You know, we're down to less than 1% positivity uh, testing right now. And it just feels better. But I am worried about as the weather gets colder. I'm, you know, I'm probably more worried about California right now than I am about New York. But as the weather gets colder and as we don't reopen the theaters, uh, I think it's going to get. I think it's going to be tough. And my hope is that the anger and outrage that have been channeled into these protests can keep working in productive directions, first of all, on November 3rd, but also as we, you know, try to build this whole city and this whole industry back better than it was, more equal than it was. You know, what, what was it like? Because you were in the hospital at the height of the pandemic. And, and then when you came out, you said those first two weeks, how you felt like, the, what did it feel like just driving to the hospital? And what did it feel like driving back from the hospital to your house? And what did you see out your window? And what was the experience of it up close? Well, it's, it's a little peculiar, Jesse, because I walked to an emergency room uh, on the 10th of March and they found that I had some heart problems which turned out was coming from low potassium, which turns out to be a symptom of COVID, but not, they didn't know any of that at the time. And I'm happy to say that I wasn't at the height of the pandemic. I was at the beginning of it. So the hospital I arrived in, which will remain nameless, was overwhelmed, but not completely overwhelmed. But just to give you an example, I spent the first night on a gurney in a corridor, uh, which I had never seen, just you know, running a fever, delirious. Then I got a bed. And at a certain point, I had to remind them that I'd been there 30 hours and nobody offered me any food. Um, the, uh, um, I mean, without, you know, I was, I was in extremely soiled clothes that were not changed. Um, so it, what I realized afterwards is, oh shit, I was catching the first wave of people being overwhelmed and the hospitals not being up to snuff. And I'm really glad I didn't get sick two, three weeks later when it really turned horrible. I mean, what um, plays went through your mind? What art went through your mind as you were sitting there? I mean, because you've experienced all this and for, you know, all the years you've been doing this, all the plays you've ever read, you know, all the movies you've ever watched, what, would, what went through your mind as you were there? Well, you know, honestly, Jesse, it wasn't really plays. Um, what was going through my mind was a lot of thoughts of the end and um, a song by a famous songwriter you know that's uh, called I Shall Be Released. Um, I just sang that over and over and over in my head um, and you know I was I was not myself and my wife ignored all the advice of her friends and came and sat with me for two days. Everybody said you can't go there you can't go there. They hadn't they had visitors yet and she just came and sat next to me and um, kept me talking a lot. But I don't remember a lot of what I was talking about. I was, you know, in the, the only really saving grace is I was so uh, just shocked. I didn't feel afraid at all. I mean, it just never occurred to me to be afraid. And well, you know, my friends were sure I was dying. I was just like, oh, I just need to sleep. 
and uh, then I you came know, when, You know, when you were back at your house and you were finally starting to feel yourself again, were you, um, and you, I mean, New York was, you know, I have so many friends there, you know, it just said that it was a symphony every night of sirens going down the street, like as you heard that and, and you were lucky enough, you know, there, but for the grace of, you know, goes, goes I, you know, what did, what, what were your thoughts then? Well, you know, first of all, I felt incredibly lucky because although they don't know for sure how long my immunity is going to last, I have tested positive for antibodies. And, you know, frankly, I feel sort of immune. I'm behaving as if I'm completely vulnerable, but that gave me a certain um, life spirit, certain um, optimism. But then really it was recognizing that on the one hand, I had a job to do at the theater that is actually, you know, and again, instead of, as I was the first couple of weeks complaining about it and feeling sorry for myself, I just realized actually, whether I like it or not, this is gonna be the biggest challenge of my career is to get my theater successfully through this, not only as a business, but as an artistic institution and to come out the other side meaning something. and. You know, because one of the things I'm sure that we're going to have to do when we come back is we're going to have to immediately prove that we're important to people. Because I think the economic situation is going to be very tough. I think there's going to be huge pressure on philanthropists to support basic human services. And I think if we're going to continue to run on the donations that we run on, we're going to have to demonstrate our usefulness right away. And that's kind of exciting, actually, Jesse, to kind of go, okay, we're going to have to prove ourselves. We don't get to coast on our reputation or the awards we've won. or We, we have to go out and say, yes, in this post-COVID time, the theater we make matters for our city. And I, I love the idea of we have to do that. We have to prove it. And if we don't, we shouldn't survive. But did you... Did you um, did you have those thoughts when you were at home? And did you or have you been back to the physical theater and just walk through the empty theater during this time? Yeah, those thoughts were from home. And of course, it feels like my office is this very chair I'm sitting in because this is where I do most of my work for the theater now. But I go back to the theater. I've been back once every couple of weeks. Uh, it's, you know, we have a skeleton operations crew for a, a number of weeks we throw through the lobby open to um, uh, distribute free food to po protesters, let them use the bathroom, let them clean up. And being in the theater during that time was a joy. It just, it was so wonderful to be in that lobby and feel like not only is it alive with people, but it's serving a social purpose. That felt fantastic. You know, you, you mentioned the sirens, yeah. uh, but we also heard all the stories and started in Italy of people going out at night and whether they were banging on pots and pans or blowing their horns. That is theater to me. What would what did, what did that what was that experience? Because that feel, felt so theatrical to see it. But what was it? Do you remember that? Oh yeah, I mean we did it every night at seven p.m. on my block, um, and I participated uh, till the end of June, so April May June, um, and then we went back to Minnesota for a couple of weeks. And when I came back, it wasn't happening anymore. And I think it had, it had run its course. But it was an absolutely emotionally significant event. Uh, I think more for those of us banging pans than for the frontline workers. But for us, it was sort of a way of saying, we're still here. We're making noise, you know. And um, if you will forgive the slight rush of class envy, those of us who don't have houses in the country stayed in the city and we're doing just fine. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's... Um, uh, in New York now, the restaurants are out on the street, and I mean, is there any way to do theater out on the street in front of the 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 theater, or is that not a way of thinking about it? Well, we're experimenting, as I said, with a couple of things this fall, and we'll see how they work. Again, what um, uh, what we have to be sure of is is a we're actually giving something of value. It doesn't do any sense to just get away with something. Uh, well, and, and so I will tell you a little, the, the first project that we're going to try to do that brings to, is intended to gather live audiences is a Get Out the Vote project. And it's a play, a short play, a short musical 
but it is designed to inspire people to go vote by telling the story of the Voting Rights Act. And that, you know, we're trying to figure out, okay, how can we do that? And, and there's a couple of ways. We can go to places, some of our community partners have large parking lots, for example, and we can go to that parking lot and we can tape out the safe distance for everybody to stand. And in that way, we can actually, you know, have people sign up for it. It'll be free, of course, we don't charge for anything. But, and there's also, we can experiment with some pop-up places uh, in some demonstrations, for example. And what we just have to be careful about is that if it gets unsafe, we need to stop doing it. Because again, we, you know, I, I'm not gonna be party to encouraging people to be unsafe. So we have to figure all that out, but it's it's fun trying. You know, in um, in this this, when we have times like this, that we're going through now, it could be Pearl Harbor, it could be, uh, you know, the AIDS crisis, it could be any number of things. Because today is September 11th. September 11th, you know, how important is it? You know, like you say, we have to prove ourselves, but how important, you know, theater is the place where, where the, you know, a crisis can be processed for the rest of society. If we don't have theater, I mean, that really tears at the very fabric of democracy. So how important is it for us to your mission and just that we come back strong? Because it's not if this is, is important, it is definitely important. Thank you, Jess, I certainly feel that way. Um, look, the, the specific thing that I think we have to face is that this pandemic has brought home the inequality in American society that has always been there but has absolutely exploded over the last 40 years. So part of what I think the demand for the theater is we've taken steps to expand our audience. We've got a mobile unit. We don't charge for free Shakespeare. We take, I think we have to make some giant leaps to do that. Okay. We have to prove that the theater is not just for the few, for the elite, for those who could afford Scalper Hamilton tickets. And you know, one of the things that we're talking about now is that when we're first allowed to gather again, we might send out multiple mobile units. So as soon as we're allowed to gather again, we go to where the audience is. We don't ask them to come to us and sit in our spaces. We go to their spaces and perform for them. Just as we have immediately saying, we need to get everybody um, on board for this project. And if this, you know, and I, for my commercial brethren on Broadway and I, say they, only because I'm distancing myself, I, I have a lot of shows on Broadway, including Girl from the North Country that'll come back when- uh, Well, let's hope uh, so. It will, it will, we'll be back. We might not make any money, but we'll be yeah. back. <laughs> but, but our Broadway brethren depend on the tourist industry in a most extraordinary way. And I don't know how fast that's gonna come back. So I think the economics of the theater are gonna change. So. You know, I think we have really got to make sure that we are reaching the people who went through this in New York and that we are speaking to them and celebrating them and honoring them in the work we do. Thank Great. You. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Oscar, so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's a, it's a total pleasure. And just somehow we have to get together. I don't know. Well, we're, I, you know, you know, Maymay's back in New York, so I, I, I'm going to find some reasons to go. Maybe we could sit far apart on a sidewalk and talk. I would be up for doing that. I mean, okay. seriously, because I, again, I feel relatively safe myself yeah. and I take distance walks with people. So if, okay. if, you, if you're up for it, let me know. Okay, I will. Good to see you, Oscar. Thank you very well, much. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. Take care. Yeah, he was great. A lot of interesting stuff there. Yeah. But you know what, there is- Good to catch up with New York. It's a lot to think about when you really do think about, you know, the, the ripple effects of, of everything that's going on, but also the possibility of how things are going to change. And it's true because there were a lot of articles about theater in New York being an elitist, old white men, I mean, running it. And so whatever can come out of that, it, it could be great. They've had a legacy, I will say, of doing incredibly diverse work in public theater. They, they was never like only doing one kind of play, but it was, it was good to, you know, kind of to have have that conversation so i'll catch you okay. next time okay See bye you. bye